Good morning, folks. Ken Hoven here in the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland. It is February the 1st, 2020. Rachel, where's Grandpa? Show the people Grandpa. There's Grandpa. For you evolutionists, all you atheists and evolutionists, we brought Grandpa for today. It's not Grandpa. It's not Grandpa? Yeah. It is? Yeah. And how old are you? Two. Two. And you can figure out, you already this think that's Grandpa. One. Who, oh, your brother's one? This is one. This is one. Like, is how many is two? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. <laughs> this is the ribs. Okay. Well, let me have Grandpa, and you go sit with your mom, and we're going to do Bible study on Luke chapter 16. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Amen. All right. Welcome to Dinosaur Adventureland. This is Steve. You got this cup for us? Not a cult. <laughs> Somebody said there's a cult in Lenox. I said, if Baptist is a cult, Lenox, the whole city of state of Alabama is in trouble. How many Baptist churches are there? I'm Kent Hovind, independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating. Baptist, we believe the Bible is true. God made the world in six days, and the evolution theory is dumb. Ooh. But if you want to believe you came from a rock, that's your business. If you think this is Grandpa, okay, you can believe what you want, but don't call it science. And don't make all of us pay to teach that in the public school system. Okay, let's see. We believe the Bible's true. Everything was made in six days, which means dinosaurs had to live with man. Called them dragons in most cultures. And evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. Okay, Yia, visiting from California, originally from what country? You were born here in America? Yeah, my parents are from Laos. Parents from Laos? Though, so do you speak any Laotian? No. No. Well, welcome. I always wanted to get over there. Uh, beautiful place. Okay. Thank you for coming. Let's see. Kenan. 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 Yes, and you got introduced the other day, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You're going to get baptized today, right? Yes, sir. After church. Yes, sir. Before lunch. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Right. Huh? Two. Two. Yeah. You, you wants to get baptized also. If you've been saved, you've got the Lord in your heart. That's yeah. amen. Praise God. Okay. Uh, staff lunch today. Normally, we go out to Chinese, but... Uh, Rick and Leah are fixing lunch for everybody here. He drove his, uh, uh, what kind of semi is that truck he's got? Uh, Volvo. He said he's got 11 miles to the gallon on that giant monster Volvo truck. It's better than our it's van. Sometimes four. Sometimes four if the wind is against him. Yeah, it varies all over the place. But anyway, he moves some things around for us. Did you make a decision about the new beer trailer? How to make it say not beer trailer? Say it, make it say... Something, I don't know. Brown paint. We're going to paint it. Brown paint, paint. okay. <laughs> We're going to paint it the same color as all the cabins. Oh, okay. We'll blend right in. All right. Yeah. Blend right in to the woods. Good. Thank, but anyway, if you want to sponsor our staff lunch someday, it costs about 150 bucks every time we take them to Chinese. Just send some money and donate it for that purpose and say, I want to help take all you guys out to lunch. We are the folks who believe dinosaurs lived with man. The Bible is true. There's our front gates at Dinosaur Adventureland. We have about 140 acres, big L-shaped piece of property given to us uh, almost four years ago now. And it was a jungle. You couldn't walk in here without a machete, but we, God has been good. We've really cleared the place. We've got hundreds of visitors from all over the world, thousands now, all over the place. And we have tours we give, and I like giving them in the Can-Am. That's the way to travel, except it gets dirty. Yeah, we'll give you the tour after lunch in the Can-Am. Okay. That thing goes 50 to zero in one second when you hit a tree. Mm -hmm. a yeah. We've had quite a few baptized here. going to have two more today, it looks like. Uh, Julie's now one of our secretaries. When you call, you'll get her. Jeff, there you are, brother. Did you see your picture? All right. Yeah. That was a great day. That How long ago was, was that now? Wonderful. That was opening, your opening day. You've been here like three years now? or oh, two, two years, January of 18. Oh, Jan January of 18. Uh -huh. Yeah, praise God. Okay, so we want to get people saved and then teach them how to love the Lord and serve Him and go do something with their life for Him. Dinosaur Adventureland is free. One of the things, one of the ways you can help us stay open for free, if you take vitamins anyway, and you should, since our health, our food supply is so depleted, uh, you can take Shackley vitamins, get them on our website, go to drdino.com, scroll down to Shackley and get them right there. Let's see, uh, we're going to build the, no, I got all that, did all that already, no, or pre previous announcements. Okay, the cruise was great. We got back from the cruise. Was that quite a trip or what? Interesting. Glad we're safe. Huh? God we're safe. So that was a huge boat. I mean, a thousand feet long, twice as long as Noah's Ark. Uh, Twelve stories. Uh, it was amazing. It had good Christian country music with Hunter and Ben and Shelley. Enjoyed getting to know them a little better. Okay, if you want to help us to open for free, you can also join our 777 Club. 
we've had lots of people saved here and baptized. We just want to win people to the Lord. Go to Dr. Dino, to the donate page, and if you make any checks, make them to CSE. And you're the one that gets those? You get the checks? You do. Okay. All right. And you've got the, do you have the big egg on display the guy gave us? The, uh, yeah. It is? Yeah. We need a hummingbird egg if somebody's got mm -hmm. Actually, we're like one of an egg, you know, blow it out so it doesn't rot, but uh, of every type of bird. So let's get an egg collection from every kind of bird. Okay, we're in the book of Luke here. In the Old Testament, which is everything that's before Jesus came, uh, Old has three letters, Testament has nine letters, and there are 39 books in the Old Testament. Uh, it tells the story of the creation and the flood and the God calling Abraham and giving his children, the Jews and the Arabs actually, some promises. Um, then Jesus came and divided everything, history, into two parts. Old Testament before Christ, New Testament after Christ. And the Bible's divided the same way. The Old Testament has 39 books, and the New Testament has 27, 3 times 9. The first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called the four Gospels. Gospel means good news. That's the story of Jesus' life. So that's the four. And Luke wrote one of those biographies, basically, of Jesus. Later, Luke wrote the book of Acts. The actions of the disciples. What did they do after Jesus left? Well, they traveled around and did what he told them to do. Go preach the gospel to every creature. Let's go to slide number 871. We'll start with Luke chapter 16, a slightly controversial chapter. If you don't like controversy, shut it off right here. You do. I love it. I was up from 2 to 4 in the morning working on this. I thought, okay, Lord, if that's what you want me to say, we'll, <laughs> we'll say it. And he said also to his disciples... There was a certain rich man which had a steward. Now, let me start right here. None of the parables, you know, Jesus often told parables, a story which teaches the truth. We do that all the time in every culture, I think, a, a parable. But none of the parables have a name in them of a particular person. This one does. Lazarus. We'll see in a minute. This is not a parable. This is a real story. Jesus said there was a certain rich man which had a steward. The same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. Hoven translation. You're fired. Yeah. Right? He heard that this bookkeeper, whoever was doing here, financier, whoever the guy, whatever job title they called it, the steward. Oh, you're wasting my stuff. You're fired. Give an account. I want to see what you've done. Let me see the books. This is an investigation into your activities. The steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me my stewardship. In other words, I'm fired. What do I do? I cannot dig. In other words, I don't like manual labor. To beg, I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Now, He's the guy who keeps the records of the books. Apparently, the guy had some rental property or something. He said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to do something so that the people that owe my master money will take me in. He's thinking ahead. Oh, right here. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto them first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Now, this sounds a little strange, but he's letting this debtor see the books. You owe the master a hundred measures. Here, you change it to 50. Well, this is obviously embezzlement and cheating and lying and all kinds of things. But normally the debtor would not get to see those records. You know, does the bank let you change your bank records? Are you want to write in, you got $5,000 more than you have? Or you owe them ten thousand less than you owe. They don't let you. They don't let you hold those records in your hand and change them. That's what this guy's doing. He said, "Take your bill, sit down, and quickly and write fifty. Then said he to another, "How much owest thou?" He said, "A hundred measures of wheat." And he said unto him, "Take thy bill and write four score, which is eighty. A score is twenty. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Now this sounds strange to us. When the boss found out what the guy had done. Hold it. That guy owed me 100 and you told him to write on 80 on the bill. So apparently the boss did check it out and find out this, this steward had cheated him. But even the, the boss even knew that was pretty shrewd because now you've got yourself a place to live when I kick you out of here. You're planning ahead. And the Lord commended the unjust steward 
because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. This is Jesus talking to his disciples now. He said, you should make some friends of the heathen because you may need a place to live someday. <laughs> make some friends of those that are of the, uh, of the unrighteous that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in the, that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, which is money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So Jesus is telling his disciples, if you can't handle money, who's going to trust you with real stuff like eternity, like soul winning or evangelism? For if... And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Now, let me give you some advice here. If you're a new Christian, several of you have just been saved for less than a couple of years. If you want, you read a passage and say, what does this mean? There are all kinds of, all, all through the centuries, people have written stories or, or, about the Bible to explain. It's called a commentary. They give their comments. Back in the 1700s, a guy named Matthew Henry did this. And the Matthew Henry commentary is generally really, really good. So just Google Matthew Henry commentary. I've got it up on screen here. Uh, many people have published his commentary. He's been dead for 300 years. But Matthew Henry, he said, what's his commentary on Luke 16? What does he say this passage means? Let me read this to you here. What we have, the property of, of it is God's. We have only the use of it. Now keep in mind, in the 1700s, they spoke a little differently than we speak today. So kind of difficult to understand the old English. You know, got to translate it in your head. So Matthew Henry said, the property of it is God's. Everything we have actually belongs to God, is what he's saying. And if for his honor. The steward wasted his Lord's goods, and we are all liable to the same charge. In other words, we've probably all wasted what God's given us too. We have not made due improvement of what God has trusted us with. How many of you can say, everything God gave me, I've used it 100% to the max for his glory? Can anybody say that? How many would have to say, look, I've probably fallen short too. God gave me this and I did this, right? We can all say that. <clears throat> the steward cannot deny it. He must make up his accounts and be gone. Settle the books and you're fired. This may teach us that death will come and deprive us of the opportunities we now have. The steward will make friends of his Lord's debtors or tenants by striking off a considerable part of their debt to the Lord which of course is wrong, illegal, but it's smart to do this for this guy to have a place to go to. The Lord referred to in this parable, commended, not the fraud. He didn't say that's a good job to cheat me, but the policy of the steward. In that respect alone, it is noted. Worldly men in the choice of their object are foolish, but in their activity and perseverance, they're often wiser than believers. The unjust steward is not set before us as an example in cheating his master or to justify any dishonesty, but to point out the careful ways of worldly men. It would be well if the children of light would learn wisdom from the men of the world and would as earnestly pursue their better object. The true riches signify spiritual blessings, and if a man spends upon himself or hoards up what God has trusted to him as to outward things, what evidence can he have? that he is an heir of God through Christ. The riches of this world are deceitful and uncertain. Let us be convinced that those who are truly rich and very rich, who are rich in faith and rich toward God, rich in Christ and the promises, let us then lay up our treasure in heaven and expect our portion from thence. So several things. One, I think you can understand the story a little better about the unjust steward, but I just wanted you to know about Matthew Henry commentary. It's a great place to go get somebody else's ideas. What does this passage mean? Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is an old English word for money. You can't serve God and make your whole goal in life to serve money. You're going to end up having to choose one or the other. And the Pharisees, by the way, if you serve God, he'll take care of all the money part. It's amazing. Say, God, I'm going to put you first. One fellow, I heard him preach one time. He said, you know, years ago, I said, Lord, I'll take care of your business if you'll take care of my business. He said, man, that's the best deal I ever made because God does. A, God's got a lot more money than I do. I've heard that man also means money and self. Money and self? Yeah. 
Oh, could be. I have to look that up. Oh. The Pharisees also, who were covetous, in other words, they liked, they loved money more than God, heard all these things, and they derided him. They made fun of Jesus for telling this story. The, the people who are not saved do not understand us Christians at all. Read the internet comments they make about me. They deride me all the time. <laughs> okay? And Dave, Professor Dave, you spend a lot of time deriding me. For you, son, we're going to use the bigger hammer. What a hammer. <clears throat> we're going to get his attention. And the goal, believe it or not, is to get Dave saved and into the family. He's got some great teaching abilities. He's got a vast knowledge of sciences. He's just got this pollution in his poison mixed in with his science about believing he came from a rock. Grandpa, we're going to help you fix that, Dave, and then you're going to make a great Christian. You can be a great evangelist using your talents for the Lord. Anyway, verse uh, uh, 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. He's talking to these Pharisees. Yeah, you guys... You justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. Think about that for a minute. God knows your hearts too. On the tour we take around here, when I go around on the Kawasaki Mule, or on the uh, Can-Am or whatever, we give the tour, and we do this, somebody got to do the satellite dish where you talk to each other. Isn't that incredible? Especially the new one across the lake, 1,900 feet. Steve, are you going to get the uh, drone and figure out the exact distance? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's phenomenal. I, I, the lesson we teach is, look, God hears everything. God has heard every word you've ever spoken in your life. He has understood every thought you've ever thunk. And get this, he loves you anyway. That's amazing. So, uh, let's see. Verse 16. Oh, for that which is, uh, 15. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The word abomination, an old English word that means it makes you sick. And there are two kinds of abominations in the Bible. Sometimes it says, if you do this, it's an abomination to you. He said, if you eat uh, certain foods, it's an abomination to you. It'll make you sick. Other times he said, if you do this, it's an abomination unto me. This is God talking. Deuteronomy 22. He said, if a man puts on a woman's clothes, that's an abomination to me. This is God talking. Okay. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. So Jesus is telling him, all the laws are going to be fulfilled. You're going to be judged by the law. Every one of those, and so are you and I. We're going to be judged by those laws. God gave the laws, Ten Commandments and more. How many have ever failed at one or two or three of the Ten Commandments? Anybody ever? Okay. Well, you're in trouble then, unless you've got somebody to take your place. And I got Jesus paid for mine. Whew, praise God. Verse 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Don't get a divorce. Now look carefully what it says. You don't put away your wife. But what if they put you away? Well, it says in 1 Corinthians 7, If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. If they left you, you're not under bondage. You're free to remarry. But God hath called us to peace. And Jesus called his own disciples unbelievers. Sometimes Christians can be unbelievers. It doesn't mean unsaved. In Luke 24, he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Can a Christian be an unbeliever? Yeah. If somebody doesn't believe in their marriage vows and they take off and leave you, and you, I get calls all the time. Brother Hovind, what do I do? My wife left. My husband left. What do I do? If they left and you can't fix it and you try and they move on with their life, well, get married. Move on. Serve God. His disciples said in John 16, Now speakest thou plainly. Verse 31, Jesus answered, Do ye now believe? Wait a minute. You mean the disciples were unbelievers for a while? You can play plenty of verses about that in John 20, verse 24. They were un it's possible for a Christian to be an unbeliever. It doesn't mean unsaved necessarily. So if the unbelieving depart, you're free. You're not under bondage. Back to Matthew Henry. What's he say on this? To this parable, our Lord added a solemn warning. You cannot serve God in the world, so divided are the two interests. When our Lord spoke thus, the covetous Pharisee treated his instructions with contempt. But he warned them that what they contended for as the law, he was a, was a wrestling of its meaning. For this Lord showed in a case respecting divorce. Our Lord. There are many covetous sticklers, sticklers for the forms of godliness, 
who are the bitterest enemies of its power and try to set others against the truth. Some people get mad at me because my wife divorced me. In Florida, you can't stop it. I say, look, I didn't, do, I didn't divorce anybody. I slept in a separate bedroom for nine months after I got home from eight and a half years of prison. I think I did commendably in a tough situation. What do you do if they leave you? Okay, God, what do I do? Move on. Feel perfectly right with God. But some of those who will say, well, I've never been divorced. Okay, uh, yay. Have you ever looked at pornography? Have you ever had evil thoughts? Have you ever, Matthew 5, 28? <laughs> Check it out. It's be like the Pharisees. Okay. Verse 16. There was a certain rich man. Here we have another one. There was. This is not a parable. This is a real story. A certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. It means he ate good food, all he wanted, every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Again, no names are ever given in parables. This is a real true story. Which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He was wishing he could just get the crumbs off the floor. The guy's hungry. And the dogs are coming to lick his sores. He's in bad shape. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, what's this Abraham's bosom? This is a teaching. Some of you new Christians need to get in your head. Before Jesus died on the cross, people did not go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom. Jesus told the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This is not heaven. This is paradise. Now in Psalm 32 it tells us, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. See, before Jesus died on the cross, the blood of all those animals covered covered their sins. Jesus' blood on the cross cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. This is a big difference. If you've got a spot on your carpet and company's coming, put a throw rug over it. Nobody sees it, but it's still there. If you really want to get it done right, though, you've got to scrub the spot out. And the blood of Christ cleanses from sin. The blood of animals covered their sin. So they really couldn't go to heaven, but they didn't deserve to go to hell. So before Jesus came, the blood of the animals covered their sins if they brought a sacrifice. Jesus came, died on the cross, and his blood can cleanse us from our sins. So now your sins are gone, not just covered. So before Jesus died on the cross, when people died, they went to a place called paradise. It's called Abraham's bosom, or they would use the phrase in the Bible, they were gathered to their fathers. That was the phrase. That was in the center of the earth. And the other part, the guy on the cross who did not repent, he went to the place which is in the Bible called Hades, Gehenna, hell, the bottomless pit, a place of torments, says he was cut off. Those are phrases used to describe when someone goes to the bad side of hell. So the, between the two, there was a big gulf fix. You couldn't get across there. And there's lots of illustrations about this. But this was all pre-resurrection. There's a song, it's gone, 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 yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is clean and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea, yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally, praise God. <coughs> my sins are G-O-N-E gone. How many have never heard that song before? I just sang it, now pay attention, okay? Right. In Ephesians it tells us, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Hoven translation. Jesus died on the cross. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His body obviously still was hanging there and then later went to the grave. But his soul, according to Psalm 22, went to hell. And he preached to those in captivity, those in Abraham's bosom, and said, guess what, guys? See these nail prints? See this hole in my side? Your sins are cleansed. Come with me. And he led them up to heaven. So Ephesians tells us he led those who were the pre-crucifixion, resurrection saints. said, now, come with me, we're going to heaven. Now that he ascended, but he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fulfill all things. You can read Ephesians 4. In 2 Corinthians it tells us we are confident 
To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I got two calls yesterday. What happens when a person, a Christian dies? Do they wait in the grave? Like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach? No. When you're at, as soon as you leave your body, you're instantly present with the Lord. What it says. So before Jesus came, their sins were covered. Jesus went to paradise to announce the good news and lead them up to heaven. Now your sins are cleansed. So today, once you're saved, you go all the way straight to heaven. See, there's only two religions in the whole world. Cain and Abel. Cain brought his fruit and vegetables. Hey, God, look what I did for you. God wouldn't take it. And many religions are trying hard to please God with their works. It's not going to, it's not going to do, it's going to work for you like it worked for Cain. It ain't going to work. Now, I hate to admit this to everybody, but sometimes I do this just for guys like Dave and uh, Simon Dan. I put it where they can see the Dr. Kent Hoven. Just <laughs> rub it in a little bit. Okay. Other religions, like Abel, he brought a sacrifice, a lamb. Lord, would you take this lamb in my place? God said, I'll take it. In Romans chapter 4, David described the blessedness of the man unto whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. God puts his righteousness on your account. So all the perfect life that Jesus lived, that's on my account. Not because of me, but God looks down from heaven and sees Kent Hoven, and all he sees is Jesus. Man, I'm taking that guy to heaven. He's perfect. Now you folks know better, but God thinks I'm fine. Yeah, okay. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus talks about that. Almost all religions of the world have some kind of teaching about an afterlife. They believe when you leave this body, when you die, something happened. There's more to man than just a body. There's something more. The Egyptians believe that. They built the huge tombs to try to keep their guy in and give him all... They would take all the, his, his wives and put them in there and seal them in the pyramid. Let them die. Just so he'd have them in the afterlife. They'd put a bunch of gold and silver in there. So he'd have that if he needed it in the afterlife. This is crazy Why thinking. Huh? Oh, yeah. They find open up the pyramids with hundreds of their wives in there with them. Dead. Long dead. Why are you looking at me like that? We don't do that anymore around here. Okay? <laughs> Alive. Yeah. I heard it. Thing in India where if somebody died, they would, when they burned them as cremation, yeah, cremate them. they put the wife on the flames too. I, I have no more comments on that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Evolutionists also believe in a form of afterlife. They think their body gets recycled into a worm or a plant. They get to live on, don't they? You get to live on in a worm. You guys are so lucky. Reuse, reduce, recycle. <laughs> <laughs> reduce, reuse, recycle. How about this? Live long. Dye green and recycle your discarded body. In the case of a human, the disintegrated body would be filtered for metals, such as tooth fillings, and then buried in a shallow grave. In tests with pigs, the remains become rich compost in 6 to 12 months. There's hope, dozens of websites about how to recycle your body. This is big stuff with the evolutionist, because after all, you don't have any hope of an eternal life, do you? You could have, but you don't want it. Okay. Recycling human bodies. Bodies into food and sewage into beer. I didn't write this. I just, I thought I got to cut and paste that. Okay. Recycling human body parts. Green living tips. This article isn't suitable for the squeamish, nor is it designed to offend anyone. Just serves to raise an important issue. You need to get your body recycled so you can live on. We should pray that the evolutionists, when they die and their body gets recycled into a plant, some Christian eats the plant and goes out preaching the gospel. Yeah. The world's first human composting facility. Let us recycle human bodies. There we go. Okay, Luke 16. <clears throat> so the rich guy died and Lazarus died. In hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. So as soon as the rich guy died, he went straight to hell. He didn't wait in the grave either. Now his body's probably rotting in a grave, but the real person is now being tormented. He seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me 
and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Does the Bible teach there's a, a, a place of torment, hell? Yeah. This is not a parable. This is a real story. Yes, sir. Here's a message for the prosperity preachers. Lazarus made it to paradise, and all he did was sat at the door of the rich man's house in agony and in trouble his whole life and still made it. For the prosperity preachers. Yeah, the, right. prosperity, is much, the prosperity preaching is a bunch of baloney. God does not promise you a wonderful life here. If you do, great. If you don't, it does, it's not proof of anything. All right. He said, I'm tormented in this flame. This guy's a moron. He sees Abraham and said, would you please send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue? We did a skit in Boy Scouts. We'd get two, boys, two new Boy Scouts to come up. We'd say, okay, you guys lay on the floor. We're going to put a blanket over you. Now, take off one thing you don't need. And the kids would take off a shoe and throw it out, you know. Take off something else you don't need. And they take off another shoe and throw it out. Take off something else you don't need. And they keep going until you, obviously they're down to their underwear or something, you know. Say, guys, none of you are getting it. What's the one thing you don't need? Blanket. The blanket. <laughs> take off the blanket. <laughs> they, they're missing the whole point. This guy's down there saying, would you please send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and give me a drop of water on my tongue for I'm tormented. He's praying for the wrong thing. Why doesn't he pray, get me out of here? How about bring a bucket of water instead of a drop of water? He's not thinking straight. But Abraham said, son, because he was a physical descendant of Abraham. He was Jewish, but he wasn't born again. Remember, this is so sad. The worst part about hell, I think, is they're going to be able to remember. And some of you that are not, that have debates with me and I'm trying to get you converted, and you refuse, you're willingly ignorant, you're going to remember every one of those times you had a chance to listen and hear the truth. You're going to remember that. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, big canyon between us, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. We can't go over there. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Old English, those that want to come over from your side can't do it. And we can't go there and you can't come here. There's a great gulf fixed between us. So before Jesus died and rose again, the center of the earth had two parts to it. Torment side and the Abraham's bosom, the pleasure side. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. This is the rich man now. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now the rich man prayed at the wrong time. He prayed after he died. It's too late. You ought to do your praying before you die and ask the Lord to forgive you and save you. Because it is too late after you die. I'm sorry. That's what the Bible teaches. He prayed to the wrong person. Why is he asking Abraham for this? Why isn't he talking to God? <laughs> he prayed for the wrong thing, a drop of water. How long would that last? If he did get that, if he got his prayer answered, what good would that do? A nanosecond. Postpone the agony for a nanosecond. He finally got concerned about his brothers. After he realized, I can't fix my problem, he said, would you please go send somebody to go warn my brothers? You know, you ought to be concerned about your lost family members now before they die. Get concerned about them. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So Abraham says to the rich guy, They've got the same Bible you had. Read it. Why don't they listen to that? And he said, Nay, Father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What, what can we learn from this parable? It's not a parable. Names are given. This is a real story. There's no sleep after death. You are conscious after death. The people in hell can see, they can hear, they can talk, they can feel pain, and they can remember. For some people, no amount of logic or evidence or reasoning will work. They don't want to believe. The Bible says, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers 
walking after their own lusts. How many have ever watched any of the debates I've done and noticed the other people are scoffers? That's no good, no kind way to explain it, that they're scoffers. And they're going to say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, this is what the scoffers say. You've been talking about Jesus coming back. We don't believe that stuff. Since it, everybody's been dying for centuries, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, this is a much more important phrase than most people realize. That phrase right there, Jesus is telling us at the end of time, in the last days, the scoffers are going to come and they're going to say, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. The doctrine in the science textbooks is called uniformitarianism. And they use the layers of strata to demonstrate this to the kids. Look at the earth science books. Uh, what shelf are they on here? That shelf right there. They teach the, the geologic column, which does not exist anywhere in the world. These layers show that, oh yeah, it's, we've always had, you know, floods and droughts and floods and droughts and long millions of years. This is what they teach. From that same geologic layer of strata that all formed in one year during Noah's flood, or not nearly all of it, probably all of it in most locations formed in one year. There have been other things since then, you know, little additions here and there. But this idea of uniformitarianism, known as the doctrine of uniformity, is the assumption that the natural laws and processes that operate in our present day science observations have always operated in the universe, in the past. What did they just say? The way it's happening now is the way it's always going to be, always happened. Now, Peter warned them in the last days, the scoffers would say this. And sure enough, they're saying it. And they're teaching it to your kids. Kids, the geologic column does not exist anywhere on the earth. All those layers formed in one big year in Noah's flood. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and heaven is plural, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So when God created the earth, there was water above the atmosphere, water in the crust of the earth. Get my video number two about the Garden of Eden for more on that. Whereby, in other words, by the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world was destroyed by the water that was already present on the planet. There was water under the crust of the earth and water above. And that's the water that destroyed the planet, made the flood. The fountains of the deep broke open. We cover that in uh, seminar part six about the flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The scoffers are ignorant of three things, the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. There's going to be a judgment day. God's going to be the judge, and he's got a record of every word you've ever said, every thought you ever thunk, and he's going to read it back. Unless you've got the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse that away. They're going to open my books. Uh, Lord, this one's empty. And I'm going to go, oh, praise God. Let's read the book from Hoven from 1965. Uh, Lord, this one's empty. Okay, how about 1966? What did he do and say that year? Lord, this one's empty. How about 67? What? Oh, this one's empty. Whew. How many of you uh, would like your books to be wiped clean, empty, gone? Yeah, okay. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. His angels were cast out with him. The devil that deceiveth them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. And the devil has deceived some of you into believing you came from a rock. I can't think of, I can't think of anything dumber than the evolution theory. It is absolutely dumb. We don't see any animal ever produce anything other than its kind. We never see life start from non-living materials. But this is what they teach. I, I was driving just yesterday and I saw a telephone pole laying beside the road and I thought, hold it. The evolutionists think this entire telephone pole was inside that dot smaller than a period on a page. Do you think you could squeeze a telephone pole into a dot smaller than a period on a page? How about one gallon of water? You know, water won't compress. They think all the oceans, as we're sailing over, we just sailed over the Gulf of Mexico, which is tiny compared to the rest of it. And the world is round and it does spin. Oh, okay, so we sailed over this little Gulf of Mexico. Do you think you could squeeze all that into a dot smaller than a period on a page? The whole Gulf of Mexico? They really believe that. The whole, oh, the Pacific, you know how much water's in the Pacific? Whoa, a lot. It, how can, they're going to be so embarrassed 
when they see Satan who deceived them into believing something so stupid, they're going to think, how could I have believed everything fit into a dot? <laughs> how could I have possibly been so dumb? They're going to be kicking themselves all around hell, I guess. I don't know. <sighs> Where the beasts are kicking each other, maybe they'll find the teacher that taught them that and kick him. Uh, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented in, just like God has a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Satan has an unholy trinity. There's the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. We'll get into that some other time. And I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. God is only going to give you what you deserve. I don't want that. They're going to look at the books. Angels are going to be reading it and say, Okay, Lord, uh, this guy said this on this date. He did this. He's got a record of every sin you've ever committed. Everyone. Got them all in the books. If, for instance, God gave Ten Commandments. Uh, he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Have you ever had a time where you've put something ahead of God? That's going to go bad for you during your trial. He's got a record of all those times. How about... Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. How many have ever used God's name as a curse word before, like I did all the time before I got saved? Uh, thou shalt honor thy father and mother. How are you doing on that one? Did you honor your father and mother? How about thou shalt not commit adultery? And Jesus added to that one, said you can't even look and lust. Yeah, Matthew 5, 28. Thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Put your hand up here. Okay, okay. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't lie. How many have ever lied? Okay, thou shalt not covet. How many ever coveted, wished you had something that belonged to somebody else? Okay, that's just the Ten Commandments, folks. There's more. But I think if, we, if God just goes by this, we're going to be in trouble. It says, the sea gave up the dead in it, the death and hell delivered up the dead in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. God's going to judge you by how did you keep these laws? I think we're all going to be in serious trouble. And that's why Jesus came and died on the cross. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You might die physically, but there's another death coming. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the future. I'm just here to warn you. If you don't want to believe, okay. Look, I've tried everything I can do with some of you evolutionists and atheists. I've tried to get some science and knowledge and common sense by whacking into your head. I've tried getting a bigger hammer. What is it going to take? It might just take... You're going to have to die and see for yourself. I don't want that. I'm trying to, even though you're mean to me and say bad things about me, I still love you. I want to give you a tour, Dinosaur Adventure Land. We want to get you saved. When I was lifeguard, they taught us, when you jump in to save a drowning person, they can get frantic. In Peoria, Illinois, in the lake there, they had a four-year-old girl fell in. Her 40-year-old dad jumped in to save her, and she drowned both of them. A four-year-old drowned a 40-year-old. We were taught, and if reach, throw, row, go. Reach for them with a pole. Throw something to them, a life preserver. Row a boat out there. Let them grab the boat. Reach, throw, row, go. The last resort is go. And if you've got to touch them, if they grab you, head for the bottom of the lake. That's what they'll let go. We had to practice that over. And I had not only water, well, a lifeguard, but I got a water safety instructor. I could train lifeguards to be lifeguards. So you, a, a, a drowning person can be frantic and incredibly strong, and they will kill you. So some of you evolutionists that are headed for hell, I'm trying to use my lifeguard skills. <sighs> Wake up. You're going to hell. I'm trying to help you. I'm not your enemy. <laughs> you think I'm your enemy. I'm not. I'm the best friend you've ever had. Better than the teachers that taught you you came from a rock. They're not your friend. Or an amoeba. Or an amoeba. Give them the amoeba. <sighs> And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I don't know what else I can say to the evolutionists and atheists. I'm trying. I do get a little sarcastic, and I haven't even asked God if he should take it away from me, because I'm, I'm like Elijah and the prophets of Baal, you know? What's the matter? Is your God sleeping? I, I, I do like making fun of their evolutionist belief they came from a rock. I'm trying. Yeah. Is he saying that if you don't believe what the scripture says, then you're not even going to believe that Jesus comes back 
and shows, mm -hmm. demonstrates to everyone that himself that he is God. It wouldn't matter. What would it have taken to get Pharaoh's attention? I mean, Moses turned the water into blood. What all, look at all the stuff Jesus did. He raised the dead. He turned water into wine. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children from one boy's sack lunch. And they still didn't believe. Okay, okay. <laughs> you can't help stupid. It, you can't help it. It can't be fixed. All right, any questions out of the group? Yes, ma'am. Can you address the, um, the objection that keeps some people away from the Lord that God's bad if he sends people to eternal torment? God is not bad for sending people to hell. God is merciful providing a way. See, God has several different hats he wears. He's the judge. He has to judge righteously. He's the creator. He's the one who can make any laws he wants. And he's the one who can say who gets to come to his heaven. And nobody gets to come to his heaven unless they are perfect. He doesn't want any sin. If he allowed us in there with our sinful nature, we would ruin that like we've ruined this place down here. Wouldn't we? So God decided nobody comes up here except perfect people. Well, none of us are perfect. So God said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come down, become a man. I'll do this for you. And if you'll accept my payment, I'll let you into my heaven. If you don't want to accept that, okay, go to hell then. So it's really, what else could he have done? And God doesn't send people to hell. He just honors their choices. That's their choice. I mean, if your neighbor burned down the other neighbor's house and the police came and arrested him and said, look, you owe this guy $200,000 or you're going to jail. And you come to your neighbor and say, listen, I don't want you to go to jail here. I'll pay the 200000 and you write out a check and you stand there and hold it. Please take this, pay the bill so you don't go to prison. If you don't want to take it, what else could somebody do? Here's Jesus has done it all. He says, here, I paid for it. Would you please accept my payment? And you don't want it. Okay. There's nothing else can be done. And you're going to kick yourself around hell and your neighbors are going to kick you also forever. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I? What, what was I thinking? There's websites about that. What were they thinking? Have you seen that where people do dumb stuff? You know, <laughs> what were you thinking when you did that? Like, duh. Like, check your gas tank with a cigarette lighter. Wonder if it got gas in there. <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> yes. Because of Adam's sin, we're all doomed to go to hell, which wouldn't seem very fair, but God loved us so much that He gave His Son that all we have to do is believe. Right. It's simple, it's free, it's paid for, it couldn't be easier, and they don't want it. Okay. Can't help them. Yep. Okay, so when I got saved and I accepted Christ as my Savior and He came into my heart and washed away all my sins. Right. So from this point, I mean, as long as I remain sin free or ask God to keep uh, uh, forgive me of my sins, when I go to, when I go to heaven before judgment, there's nothing in the. In well, here, here's the difference now. If you sin after you accept Christ as your Savior, which all of us do, mm -hmm. it's handled differently. If your son and my son are out playing baseball in the front yard, and I say, boys, don't play here. You're going to break the window on the van. Go in the backyard and play ball. And they don't listen. And sure enough, they break the window. What happens next depends upon which kid broke the window. If your kid broke the window, it might become a legal matter. Say, look, you owe me 300 bucks, you know, pay up or I'm going to have to call the law. But if my kid broke the window, it's not a legal matter. It's a family matter. We're going to settle this in the family. So if you sin after you become God's child, it's a family matter. It's not a legal matter. Your sins are paid for, but he may still have to punish you as any father would punish his child. Say, look, son. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a man who's saved in the church, but he's living in adultery with his dad's wife, which would have to be his mom or stepmom. Right. He, Paul said, the heathen don't even do this. What is wrong with you in this church? Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved. This guy's still going to heaven. He's going early, but he's going. So if you as God's child sin and he tells you, hey, you need to stop that, and you don't. You, like this one, what's eight months old? Uh, one, year. one year. When he wets his diaper, do you spank him or just go put a new diaper on? Just slap a 
one on. Slap a new one on, okay? Now, when he's three years old, it might be time to say, son, look, knock it off, okay? There's the potty. Let me show you how to use this thing. Now, when he's five years old, you might have to handle it a little differently. Son, I told you to go potty, you know, why didn't you? If he's 15 years old, it's going to really be embarrassing. So it's handled differently depending upon their age level. If you're a brand new Christian, God will put up with things out of you that he probably would not put up with out of me. He'd say, son, you've been in the family 51 years. You know better. Knock it off. He might have to handle it differently. So it's handled differently whether you're in the family or not. It's also handled differently how long you've been in the family. Does that make sense? So there might be some sin or some habit you have that God doesn't like, and he keeps poking you and reminding you, knock it off, stop. And you, but you, after a while, he's going to stop the poking and start yeah. get your attention some other way, okay? <laughs> but, that, but you won't go to hell. You can't. Then, if you could go to hell and lose your salvation, then his, his promises are lies, because he said you shall have eternal life. There's hundreds of places, or dozens of places in the Bible that says if you believe, you have have eternal life. I'm going to heaven. Nothing I can do about it. Nothing anybody can do about it. I'm going. Yep. Uh, I love the imagery of being born again because it's it's so final and you can't be unborn. You can't be unborn. You got four kids sitting right here. You, it's, it's an irreversible process. Right. You're a pediatrician. Are there, can, is it possible to get unborn? They'll be part of the family forever. Yep. You're stuck with them. They're stuck with you and you're stuck with them. Sorry about that. Yep. <laughs> Doesn't it say in the New Testament uh, that God chastises those whom he loves? Oh, yeah. Loves See, if you're, I'm not going to spank the neighbor kid. Right. I'll spank my kids, but if, it, if the neighbor kid breaks my window, I'm not going to go slap him or spank him. No, it's not my kid. So I'm not, the, God's not going to, God's going to take care of his children differently. So for me, he's going to be my father when I meet him. For others, he's going to be their judge, an angry judge. Because he's got a list of everything they did wrong. Not only that, he's got the list of everything they did wrong and the proof that he offered a payment himself. What did he go through on that cross? He said, look, what else could I have done? I tried. I died on the cross. You want to die on a cross and see what that feels like? God's up there thinking, wake up, you guys. I, I want you to, I want to forgive you. But if you don't want it, okay, go to hell then. I'm sure he'll be, but he has to be a fair judge. Yes. And a righteous judge. And righteous. That judgment, those that aren't saved are, are judged for the sins they've committed in the books. But the righteous, those of us that are saved, it's a reward ceremony. Right. The good things we've done, ministering, helping, loving one another, those things we get crown jewels or right. whatever. And then we're going to have Frisbee contest with Jesus. And see, the lost people think that God's going to give them some kind of prize for their good works. No. And forget about their bad ones. And forget about their bad. So like the boy brought home his report card from seventh or fourth grade, I think it was, and it was pretty bad. So dad came home from work and he said, dad, uh, here's my report card. But before you say anything, I want to show you your report card from fourth grade. I found it up in the attic in the box. So he showed his dad his fourth grade report card. Dad looked at them both side by side. He said, well, son, you're right. Mine's about the same as yours. So I guess the only fair thing is for me to give you what my dad gave me. <laughs> God's going to be fair. Okay, You're only going to get what you deserve. You're fine. Yes. I think rather than um, like lying and stealing and stuff, the more grievous is that we have rejected a beautiful savior. Yeah, I mean, if he died on the cross and offers the payment and you reject that, that's, I think that'll make him upset. And we're, we're, the whole ministry here is to try to get you to accept that. So, we're going to have a baptism, brother. You ready? Sure. And then lunch will be ready in about 10 minutes. Come on down and visit Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. We'll give you the real tour. Somebody yesterday took the grandma tour. I couldn't believe it. I said, <laughs> they, I said you want the real tour of the grandma? She said, I want the grandma. I said, okay, that's boring. I know two people that said they wanted the grandma tour, and you took them on the real tour. Oh. Well, the dad, the husband talked them out of it in that case. I don't. If somebody wants the grandma tour, that's all I give them. And it's boring. It's boring as all get out. But the real tour, that's exciting. <laughs> all right. See you tomorrow. Bye.